Hey, what's up? Silas here. This is going to be a follow-up video to the video I did about the school shooting that occurred in Florida. And um, first, I want to say that um, it's kind of good news to hear that still the death toll didn't go up. You know, this kind of thing where I thought, oh, the death toll was going to go up. It was 17 people at that time. And at the time of me recording this, a few days later, it still is at 17 people, which I think is good news, at least comparatively to what it could have been. And this is just part of what's showing with the advancements in medical technology and just safety and just just the craziness of um, humanity and things like that. So I think that's something good to think of and keep in mind. Next, I want to talk about the expected anti-gun or gun control kind of uh, fervor that went on. People saying, oh, we need more gun control. We need it for this, we need it for that. One of the big ones was that whole 18 there have been 18 school shootings since the start of the year in the United States of America. That was roundly debunked, even some of the major mainstream media sources. I think they're finally catching on. They had some kind of seclusion in what they're covering and things like that, and not really understanding that people are thinking they're fall news, not necessarily fake news, but fall news, where they're just covering certain things that are just not really newsworthy where it's like, yes, this is somebody's argument, but if you're telling me something that's newsworthy, is it salient, is it important? Is it someone's opinion or is it an actual news story, something that's actually researched? So some people went on, and there's going to be links below to that, and debunked it. The first one I saw was in Daily Wire, as I'd mentioned in the previous video, that whole idea of somebody in the parking lot not being involved with the school, shooting at each other. That shouldn't be considered to be a school shooting, and people are pointing that out. So that's a positive thing. I think that's a step in the, in the right direction. With the reporting, there's also two cases of false identification. The first one was a picture of a young guy with his fist up and a communist shirt on. People were like, oh, look, that's him. He's socialist. Socialist kills again. Democrat kills again. And then it turns out that's not him. So that kind of gets shut down. Next one, oh, he has ties to a white nationalist group. I think this actually came out of 4chan. And if you guys don't know what 4chan is, 4chan is just a place that trolls the hell out of people in some cases and just goes on and it's just kind of um, it's, it's internet group where people just go and make up stories or just talk about different things. Um, I think one of their, one of one of these funny videos I was talking about how the FBI, and I'll get back to this later, the FBI wasn't able to track down somebody using Nicholas, this Nicholas guy using his own name saying he was going to be a professional shooter, but um, 4chan and people on 8chan have been doing this ongoing thing with Shia LaBeouf who's um, an actor in the United States of America, art, actor and artist and he had this he will not divide us kind of project and after it failed with just the regular thing where it was like this camera on this wall where people would talk to he started putting a flag in different places and 4chan find a way to triangulate where that flag was where he put the flag up and like okay we found it someone's taking it down he goes out to Iceland, he's in some he's in some cabin somewhere, and then 4chan's like, okay, we're going through, I think it was like listings of cabins in Iceland or something, and then they went and found the cabin that had the right kind of, uh, what's it called, the right kind of wood grain, and they tracked it down. So it was just showing how someone was saying, look, this is what the private sector can do to find stuff, and then the public sector of the FBI failing to find the, the guy, Nicholas, who posted in a video on YouTube saying that, He's going to become a professional shooter. Now, with this thing, I have two things about this. First, I do understand that YouTube takes people down, takes videos down, blocks videos down for some minor things, for some issues where you're like, why are they doing this? The FBI has been following this Russia first collusion, now obstruction narrative and saying that Russian trolls were affecting the election, etc. And then people are wondering, look, the FBI was spending too much time doing that but they couldn't focus on this, catching this guy. First of all, the police are normally um, a force. They normally do stuff after. They're not really a preventive force. So I think people should understand that. Second, there are multiple people. I think anybody who would be in charge of actually going and finding someone like Nicholas, this guy, this shooter, after that comment, would not be the same person involved with something like the Mueller investigation with Donald J. Trump. I think there would be different departments. I could be wrong. Next, there's also that whole thing where people are talking about how YouTube, Twitter, other people are overzealous. When somebody says, I've been threatened, somebody's saying X, Y, Z. Now, when they do that, people say, oh, this person is just trolling. This person is just saying something. Don't take it so seriously. 
So there are people who do go online and troll and say some really heinous stuff. Heinous, 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 heinous. Some truly heinous stuff. But are we supposed to react to every single one of them? When people make fun of certain celebrities, make fun of certain social justice warriors for getting triggered at these things, then should they think all those threats? Are you trying to say that, yes, these social justice warriors shouldn't just buck up and toughen up. They should actually take every single person that says anything to them as an actual threat. And I know he said I'm going to be a professional shooter, but this might not come off well. I mean, you might, you might tell me if I'm wrong on this, but how do you become a professional shooter? Don't you do it once and you're done? I mean, I don't know if the guy expected to do it more, but anyway. So I do understand he had other issues. So when you count all the other issues that he had, if everybody could have put two plus two plus three multiplied by 15, carry over the 12, divide it by whatnot, and put all that together and then you knew that and then they still didn't do anything, then I'd say yes, and that's a big issue. But it's different groups of people knowing different points of information, not putting two and two together, and that's an unfortunate situation. So I get that. And um, yeah, I <laughs> lost the first point here. I'm going to go back and check, but that's the point I wanted to talk about, where I don't think, I personally don't think like, hey, how come the FBI hasn't done this? I think it's a positive thing to see that, hey, look, the FBI, people need to realize that these people aren't some kind of like infallible or some kind of omnipotent force out there that's doing this like minority reports type future fucking policing. Excuse my cursing. <laughs> this future policing. They can't really do that. They, they're, just, they're also humans. They have limitations. And yes, they can do better. You can expect better. But this is the case there. Now, with that being said, if you're still here, I think another good thing to point out right now is the fact that since the FBI isn't this kind of super cop, the fact that so few people actually end up doing this horrendous act that happened is a positive thing. To me, that kind of makes me think that, hey, humans are actually better than you think they are. Because if you really think about it, how many people could actually do this? You know, how many people could actually just be quiet and do this? How many people can actually go out there and shoot up places like this? A lot more than actually you think. So, they're not not doing this because there's some kind of super force preventing them. They're not doing this because I think, in general, humans are good people and don't want to bring this kind of harm to other people. Yeah, so, with the 4chan thing, with 4chan I think that's the kind of thing where this is the future of those old networks used to have, of maybe housewives at home in the neighborhood. They would pass on information. If a stranger came in, they would let everybody know if something happened to someone's kid. They would let everybody know. You could count on each other for spreading information that way. That grapevine, I think now that's the kind of grapevine you have here in, um, in 4chan and things like that online. But I don't think the world has come even close to maximizing on the effect. Not even maximizing, not even utilizing. I don't think we're even at 1% of what we can do with these information networks. And I look forward to the kind of world that's going to exist when we're using it to even 10%, to even 15%. So next is the whole gun control thing. People arguing that we need fewer guns and that will make the United States of America safer, that there's too many guns out there. Well, in the past when people used to carry guns a lot more frequently, a lot more openly, there were fewer shootings. So it's not necessarily tied with there being more guns in the United States of America today than there were in the past. Next, why don't the people approach this like cars and say, okay, we need a situation where we need better trained people. We need people who are trained with guns. We need to get a situation where maybe all kids are familiar with guns and they'd be more common to know what to do when faced with a gun or how to attack somebody who's attacking them with a gun, how to keep safe around the gun. Why don't you get a situation where we need more gun safety? And why I'm saying this is because when people, the same people who argue, a lot of the same people who argue for gun control, taking guns away, they will come out and say, oh, we need common sense gun control. You ask them for actual points, and this actually happened. I went through a couple of back and forths with somebody who said we need more gun control. And I just asked them, do you know any actual points? Are there any actual solutions you're offering? The person eventually just said, no, I don't have any solutions. I'm literally just saying we need more gun control. And that's just the kind of thing that you find. Anyway, so back to this thing. When people, a lot of these people were saying we need to take guns away, we need fewer guns. They're also pro-abortion. They get to a situation where people say, there's too many abortions, too many kids are dying, we need to stop this, we need to reduce people's access to abortions. But those people say, no, we need better training, we need to have more access to them, we need better Planned Parenthood and people like this we need to train people more about, about having kids and things like that, and that will reduce the number of abortions happening, or unwanted pregnancies. They'll say that. but. If you, too, if you take that same argument and you say, okay, with guns, instead of taking the guns away, taking the access to guns away, why don't you have a planned 
planned shooting hood? I don't know. What it, I don't know what it would be. A Planned Parenthood equivalent of guns, where you have a situation where they're training people to use guns instead of getting a situation where you take the guns away. So if people are saying we need to reduce the chance for abortions by training people, by teaching people about pregnancy, then why don't they also come out and say we need to reduce the chances of people dying from guns by teaching people about guns. Now to finish off, I'm going to go, um, this thing I recorded last night, we're having a brownout, uh, so there was no video with it, so I'll just have a different video playing with it. But it was just observations about seeing more kids talk about their experience there and seeing how nervous they were and how they're behaving and how they were smiling. And um, I kind of came to a realization that a lot of people on the left, when they go to events, like they go to these, I'll have this photo up where these people are at this event, I guess, feminist and type people. They're protesting against slut shaming, I'm guessing. But you look at the faces on these people, even something I witnessed at the Women's March, how people were smiling and happy. And they're saying, yes, Donald Trump is a Nazi. Some people are saying he's a Nazi. He's going to ruin this country. Yet they're happy and smiling and jovial. And I'm like, this is really weird. Why are you smiling and happy like this? And then you kind of think about these kids who are smiling, happy, nervous. And they're doing it out of adrenaline, out of shock, out of fear, out of a lack of feeling like they can't control what happened and things like that. And there may be a similarity to that where a lot of the people on the left who go to these events and do these kind of things may be mentally adolescents when they come to approach some of these issues. And there's a few different things that have been... I've been following this story since yesterday, and there's a few different things I'd like to talk about. One thing is the video. It's just... I remember when the tsunami happened, when the earthquake hit, the Fukushima thing, the Japan thing. It was in 2006, if I'm not mistaken. 2006, 2005. There was a tsunami after a big earthquake off the coast of Japan. And I was thinking, wow, this is going to be this is going to be awesome in the way that we're going to get a lot of film of what actually happens after something like this happens. Because it had happened before in Indonesia, it's happened before in other countries, this kind of tsunami thing, but there was very little film. But a country like Japan, I was thinking, okay, a lot of people have tech, a lot of people have access to this, we're going to get a lot of film. Now this has happened, a similar thing with this attack. This was in an affluent neighborhood. The kids are now equipped with phones. They have technology. They have the ability to deal with this. Now, some awesome things about this. And by awesome, I'm using the words awesome. In not like, awesome, cool, this is amazing. I wish this could happen. But awesome in like seeing a volcano blow up. You see a volcano blow up, and that's an awesome thing. Because you're like, wow, this is a transfixing thing. This is something that captures your attention. You see what's happening, and this is a similar thing that's occurred with this attack. I personally was involved in an attack, um, well, I was close to one here, the Westgate attack here in Nairobi, Kenya, happened at the mall, and I was with a friend, was with my niece at the time, and she had a friend that was tweeting from inside the mall while it was under siege. And this is something that you see that happened with this school thing. People were sending film, people were sending pictures, people were sending images and talking about what was happening in the school. Kids apparently have gone out and shared video of scenes inside the school, people dead, bodies on the ground, talking about that information. Those are videos that I'm not, I'm probably going to avoid seeing those videos. Seen some post uh, violence videos like the Barcelona attack where um, somebody drove down this kind of shopping street and killed people. I remember seeing some video from, um, what's it called, the Paris Bastille Day attack. I've seen some video from the Westgate attack. I think for, for now I'm okay without seeing dead bodies, especially if it's kids and things like that in this situation. But coming back to the story, uh, coming back to what I was talking about here, is you see these kids and just thinking about the amount of technology and the amount of information sharing abilities that they have, they have these information networks because when you have things like apps like Discord or um, different kind of apps, WhatsApp groups, people will have their own personal groups and their own networks where they're not necessarily just using these open networks to everyone, but they have networks that they, they themselves can use within their own communities. So they're sharing information, talking about this. Once they found out the identity of the kid, people started talking and saying, oh, do you remember this kid? Do you have material on what he did? And then it's like... They're doing more reporting, they're doing even more investigating than the actual officials are doing. And I think that bodes well for the future, 
for actually getting information on this and preventing this from happening in the future. From what you learn here, from knowing that, look, maybe some people actually saw something, but they didn't say anything. But now it might be taken more seriously. They might be able to stand up and say things and talk about the signs that were there before. Another thing about this that I'm considering really, it's really taking me aback, is just seeing them posting videos about what happened with them right after on social media. Similar to how people went directly, like you saw this first with the James Damore thing. James Damore came out and he was fired by Google after the Google memo. And what he did was go on to alternative media sources and talk to people about his experience. Talk to them directly and say, this is what happened to me. This is how I experienced it. These are my thoughts on it. Now, you have these kids not necessarily going on the established media sources, but they're going on themselves. They're going and posting on YouTube, on social media platforms, on Twitter, talking about what happened in those situations. Just talking to people and saying, this is what I saw. This is what happened. And that's showing how information is going to get out in the future. And for the foreseeable future, this is only going to increase. Another thing, kind of creepy, is how they're being interviewed. The few interviews that I've seen are just seeing them talking to certain people. And you see them kind of giggle or behave in a certain way that children behave in that way. I've been watching this Bombard's Body Language YouTube channel and picked up some things on body language. I'm not really the best at it, but I've seen this and it's made me pick up some cues and I was kind of seeing that, oh, look, these are children who just survived an insanely horrific situation. So they're going to be stressed out. They're going to have had adrenaline rushing in their bodies before. Some of them might still have adrenaline in their system or they may be burnt out from that. They may be in shock. So this kind of way that you see them behave, it's not that they're taking it lightly, but it's just the coping mechanism that they have for dealing with this situation. You either laugh or cry and they've probably cried already and now it's a laughing part. It's just their nerves are on edge. And also seeing that kind of reminds me about how some people approach issues. Some people talk about issues that they perceive to be really horrific issues, structural racism, being in a rape culture, but they talk about it in this kind of giggling, jovial sense. And I was kind of thinking, those people may be mental children in a way, where they're not actually perceiving evil things, perceiving horrible things in a way that you think an adult would approach it in a serious way, in a composed way, or in a way to acknowledge this is a horrific thing, this is something we have to deal with, and this is the steps that we're going to take. Yet you see some communities just coming out and saying, oh, these are horrific things, somebody needs to do something else about this, we're kind of taking this in a jovial way, we're here protesting in the streets, having fun, like, yeah, we're in a rape culture, like, people need to stop, oh yeah, this and this, but we're out here having a party while we do this. And that thing has always weirded me out. I'm like, how are you guys so happy about something that's supposedly so bad? When you see that with ostensible adults, people that are of age in their 20s, in their 30s, in their 40s in some cases, even with the Women's March, people in their 80s, as I mentioned in the Women's March video that I've done, where you have grandparents out there with generations of their families out there jovially talking about how Trump is going to be the death of the United States of America. And I'm like, why are you smiling? If you really think this is going to happen, why are you happy? But yeah. So thank you for listening and watching, and excuse me with the sound, I'll try to do better. I know there's some parts in this that had some wind. But one last thing on these shooters. A lot of them in the United States of America are on SSRIs, which are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So I think more needs to be done to test and see why does this happen? What does it do to people's minds? What does it do to how they approach the world, how they go out and deal with things? Last, I'd like to ask, is there anyone out there listening to this that actually changed their mind on their stance on gun control or on guns with the arguments that occurred after this event?